Hi, everyone. Hi, Angela. Hi, Christine. It's good to see you on this platform, Angela. I'm excited to be here. One day I still want to come up and visit your center. Oh, that would be really nice. I'd love to meet you in person, Angela. Excuse me? Yes, I'd love to meet you in person one day. Oh, I would love I would love to come and, and have you as a guest speaker in one of my uh, university classes one night. That would be wonderful. But we can talk later. Yes. Thank you. Is that Susan Weber, the Susan Weber I used to know some time ago through Flacey? It is. How nice. are you? Good. I haven't seen you for years. It's Welcome. It's been a long time. Yep. Yeah. And I see Christine is here from Tallahassee. Hi, Christine. And Renee, good to see you also. Everybody, actually. Nancy, we saw her the other day. Fantastic. Well, Hi, Renee. Hello. It's like old home week. <laughs> I know I don't have the book yet. I'm hoping to get it before the book study ends. That way I can kind of still follow along. <laughs> That'd yeah. be wonderful. Fantastic. We'll give about one more minute and then we'll, we'll hit the ground running, folks, because we know that your time is valuable as well. Yeah, good. <laughs> and I know the waiting room is emptied out, so anybody that joins us um, can come right in uh, with it. Good. Yeah. So we did write a quick welcome in our chat. And so please feel free that if you have any ideas or questions you wanna share, you're welcome to put them in the chat and we can uh, address those going forward during our, our discussion times. I think we uh, we had 28 people registered according to, uh, I think Holly and Julie, we saw those numbers. Yes. But I see, what do we have? We have four, eight, nine, 11. 10. Uh, glory, glory, that's wonderful, a small group. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and I think it'll grow. I know there's a couple more that'll probably pop on in just a minute. That's great. So, without further ado, welcome to the inaugural Felici Play Chapter book study. Uh, for those uh, that have known Felici for a while, they know there's always some fun activity or event that brings knowledge and wisdom into your profession. My name is Julie Perry. I'm an adjunct professor at Indian River State College. I was an owner director for 30 years. Um, recently sold my center and doing more college teaching and consulting and training around the state of Florida and beyond. And I'm honored uh, this evening to present uh, the two main hosts, if you will. Uh, we have Dr. Walter Drew, who has been a mentor and friend of many of us for many, many years. And he is also the uh, one of the main authors of our book tonight. I know it's all blurry, but there it is. And he'll, we'll dive more into that. Um, he is the founder and director of the Institute for Self-Active Education, and he's our lead facilitator in the play chapter. The, if what you see during this book study is something that really gets you going, we encourage you to join us next Tuesday night for our play chapter. We have a great guest speaker. We'll talk to you later on about that. And so for the past 40 years, Dr. Drew has been researching and leading hands-on play experiences with children and adults and he uses open-ended materials and many of them are recyclable materials. And the idea is to study play across the human lifespan. And he's written numerous books, this one being the most recent. He's been a national presenter at NACI. He's been a trainer around the country. And so we are super stoked to have him here um, being kind of our lead with regards to uh, our book study, but not to take away from any importance and any amazing work is the Miss Wonderful Paula Lopez. And she's the other facilitator of this story time, if you will, over the next four sessions. And Paula is the founder and executive director of an amazing preschool in Ocala, Florida called Kinderoo Children's Academy. 
I have just been blessed to follow her professional journey as an educator. Um, she really puts children first and play first. And I've watched that over the years, getting to know her so much so that I use a lot of her. She's an amazing photographer as well. Um, and she's great at video editing. She has an amazing creative spirit. And I've used a lot of her videos and pictures of her school as incentives, as a way to teach my students at about what play looks like, what does creativity look like in young children? And Paula is just the pinnacle of that. Uh, she serves on several state boards and tax force, including various early learning coalitions, um, the College of Central Florida, and she's also another lead facilitator for the play chapter. And she's presented at NACI as well. So um, without further ado, I present to you Walter Drew, Paula Lopez, and the Self-Active Playbook. So we hope you'll join along. Again, make sure you add uh, things in the comments as needed. So I turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Julie, for that great introduction. Um, so I want to share something that I prepared for all of you just to get us started. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. Um, Julie. This is Holly, I can help. Um, do you see the big green button at the bottom that says share screen? I did, I'm, I'm pressing share screen. And it's the- and Does the windows pop up and- It says, it, it, it has like a little triangle with an exclamation mark with like desktop. Let me get the lock. So you'll need to- choose like do you is the window that you're wanting to share up and available um i think i see what's going on i, I um i guess my laptop does not um oh it's not compatible I, i'm not i'm not sure but um is she assigned as a co-host on zoom you no know, she, she can share it's it might just be her um computer um, I've shared before, so I'm not sure if I'm required to do an update, but I can, I can continue. Um, so I had, um, first of all, I want to welcome everyone, and I do want to remind everyone to please mute yourself so that um, we can listen to the speakers. Um, and I, I want to take the moment, like you already know a little bit about um, Dr. Drew and I, but I'd like to see if we can introduce ourselves so that we can, while we're in this group together, we, we wanna form a relationship. So we could just take a few moments to introduce ourselves. I'll start just because I'm gonna have to um, step off and you guys can always text me. My name's Holly McPhail. I'm totally in my car at my, at my son's soccer field, which is why I have to step off, but I wanted to make sure that you guys got kickstarted um, before, um, like for your first day. I am the events and communications manager with Lacey. I've been with the organization for two years. And my one of my favorite parts has been learning from Dr. Drew and Paolo um, about play. Um, being in the field of communications means that I don't know what you guys do day in and day out in centers and participating with them and learning from them has afforded me that. So I'm really enjoying, uh, I'm going to enjoy following along with this book study and hopefully we'll be able to be more focused um, and available at our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Yes. I think Paula has going to continue for a moment, right, Paula? Um, yes, I, I wanted to um, see if we can introduce ourselves. And while we're introducing ourselves, I'm trying to see if I can get my settings in order to share what I have prepared for tonight. Okay. Well, in that case, I think I'll just go ahead first while you play with that little problem, okay? Uh, so I'm Walter Drew, and I think Julie said plenty about me. So I'll set that aside and just join with Holly and Julie in welcoming you. Thank you for dedicating time on a weeknight away from your families after a busy day of work to be present 
Um, we really appreciate the devotion of your time and grateful for your participation in this evening's explorations around play, self-active play. And it's, Paul, you let me know when you're ready to go. Otherwise, I'll just kind of open it up for folks. Maybe they would like to introduce themselves too. Uh, may I pick you just to make it easy? I see Tammy Spidell, who's here, and she too is one of the Flacy Play Chapter facilitators. So I'm going to ask you all just to say your name and where you're from, just real brief, and we'll see if we can catch everybody before we continue for this one hour together. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, I'm Tammy Spidel, and I've been with um, Flacy for about 10 years. Um, I do have a play school in my home. Um, probably 30% of my floor space is all space for the kids to play in. And I've been doing full play, active play, self-child directed play for about 20 years. Thank you, Tammy. Oh, and Chris I'm in Temple, Temp the Tampa area. Yeah. And Christine Bertak is up in Tallahassee. Christine? Uh, yes, hi, I'm Chris Bertak, and I have a preschool here, uh, Answorth Academy, and we've been accredited, I, I'm guessing 20 years. It's been a long time, um, and we're currently going through reaccreditation now, but I am looking forward to enjoying this play uh, group, this learning more about the play. Of course, we that's been our philosophy for years, that children learn through their play. And I um, am just looking for having some fun with this, I hope, and learning a lot. Yeah, thank you, Chris. How are we doing, Paula? Um, I'm, I'm gonna have to um, go without the, um, the slideshow that I have, but, um, but it's okay. It's okay. This is all information that I wanted to share. So um, if you have a piece of paper to write down the information, um, then I can post all this in our Facebook group, which that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today. We've created a private Facebook group just for this book club. And it's a way for us to stay connected, to ask questions. And I really hope that we find a, a, a community within this group, because at the end, um, our hope is to have a field trip together and then that way we all get to know each other in person. Um, that's, that's me, Paula. So you can read that for a minute. And while you're reading that, I want to, I would love to hear from both Vanessa and uh, Nancy real quick. Vanessa, hi, honey. Oh, I think you're on mute, love. Are you on mute? No, now you're on mute. Hmm. Well, I, I can tell you that Vanessa is one of our Indian River State College students, and it's so great to see her smiling face. I don't get to see my students' faces very much because we're online and everybody's kind of visually. So it's nice to see you, and I'm really, 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 really super glad you're here. How about Nancy Perez? Nancy Perez, are you there? I, I knew it was a little bit busy earlier for that. And we have uh, we have two Nancys. Don't you love when there's a classroom with two of the same kids' names? <laughs> I don't want to try to to do your last name. Help me out. Nakaoka. Nakaoka. What a beautiful name! Thank you for sharing. Tell us a little bit Thanks. about where you're from. Um, uh, I'm originally from Wisconsin, but right now I'm in Minnesota. And, but I spent about 22 years in Japan and oh. teaching preschool there. Um, but currently I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh. Thank you, Nancy. That's wonderful. How about um, Susan Weber, how about you? Hi. Hi. <laughs> so good to see some of old friends. Yes. Tell us, who, what, where are you? What are you doing? I am the director. Sorry, my chihuahua is on my lap. Oh. I'm the director of professional development for the Lou Williams Center for Early Learning for our club. Yeah. And um, one of my teachers is on it, Dominique Grinnell. She's absolutely amazing. Um, one day she's going to be teacher of the year. I just know it. Oh. Um, but I'm also an adjunct at St. Petersburg College. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So let's move on to Dominique then. Hi. Oh, thank you so much. 
Um, I'm Dominique. Um, I'm a teacher at Lou Williams, and I've been there since we opened uh, for seven years. And I'm really excited for this class because I'm all about play and making sure everything's intentional. So nice to meet you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dominique. And let's see, we have Gabriella. Let's see if she's able to pop on. Hi, good evening. Hi. My name is Gabriela Oraneta. I'm from Venezuela. I live in Ocala. I work at Kinderu Children's Academy. Um, I have been working at Wonderful School for two years. And um, although my exper experience is little, I confess that I have uh, had a lot of fun. <laughs> 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 Gracias. Thank you for being here, Gabriela. Thank you. All right. And then I have Miss Martinez. And I'm not sure how to pronounce your first name either. So I'm going to not try. <laughs> oh, unmute yourself, love. Okay. Yeah. My name is Jenny, Jenny Gallego Martinez. Um, I'm working at Kinder Children's Academy. Yep. And um, what else? I live in Ocala. Um, I'm the first uh, Placey um, Teacher of the Year, um, Florida Teacher of the Year. And I'm so excited to be in the group and know you guys. <laughs> She's worked really hard alongside her companions. and It's been super to get to see how much you've grown as well. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Renee, I don't think we got you. Did we get you yet, Miss Renee? I mean, I know you, but. <laughs> no, not yet. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm in Pinellas County and I've been in the field for 22 years and very, play-based in my learn, um, teaching. Yep. And you have um, a blog site, right? That, that yes. that's kind of how I got to know you is from the owl's nest. Uh, kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of that's the way. So thank you for being so faithful in your attendance to the different events. We appreciate it so much. Paula, back to you, my, my friend. Okay, Julie, so <clears throat> I did send a PowerPoint presentation. If you're not able to share it, that's okay. I'll, I'll proceed. Um, so I was saying that we do have a Facebook group that we formed. It's called Self Active Playbook Club. So if you send us a, a request, um, search for Self Active Playbook Club. So that was all on the PowerPoint uh, presentation, but um, if, maybe Julie can type it on the, on the comments and yeah. um, send us a request. And then um, all this information is gonna be on that group. Um, so we have, um, we have, we're gonna be together for four months and it's gonna be a four month journey. Um, this, uh, on the first chapter, we're gonna be looking at the researchers who have created the foundation of self-active play. Um, on the second month, we'll have, um, we'll look at chapter two and at the seven principles of self-active play and the powerful role of play in education and human development. And then on the third month, we're gonna go over chapter three and we're gonna learn about the essential elements and materials of self-active play processes, the role of the adult and children's self-active play and the two basic types of self-active play experiences, which is um, solo play and collaborative play. And then in chapter four, five and six, that will be our uh, final month. Um, we're going to take a look at the case studies and how all this can be applied into your different settings. Um, so it's not just in preschool, but um, there are other settings that we can apply this and, and we'll go over that in those chapters. Um, when you send us the, the request on Facebook, you're going to find study guides. So there's already a study guide for chapter one, and it pretty much just guides you through, um, through the chapter through the chapters and um, every month we'll have a new one added um, and then it just has questions for you to to ponder upon so that during our next gathering 
um, we can have you know a more in depth conversation. Um, Dr. Drew, uh, would you like to commence our gathering with yes with uh, um, the activity that you have in mind for us today? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Paula. Um, so um, let's see. We're we're all together for a few moments, and we're going to talk a little bit about that first chapter that looks at who are some of the people that laid the groundwork over many years for self-active play. But before we do that, let's uh, transition more fully into um, a deeper relaxation, if you will, a clarifying, and take one minute one minute for a, a silent meditation where we focus intentionally on our breath, uh, take a couple of good deep breaths and let them out slowly, close your eyes for a minute and allow your mind simply to wander and relax before we begin the formal discussion, okay? I'll keep time, 60 seconds, close your eyes, be present, Take a couple of deep breaths and let them out slowly and just relax for one minute. Okay, so that was just one moment. And uh, like children, we are transitioning from one experience to another. This next part is a little different from what we all just experienced. I'm going to share a little bit about my history and how I got into this work. And then we'll just kind of begin a discussion from uh, that chapter one, all those theorists who laid the groundwork. But before I begin, I want to mention to you that the essential purpose, the main driving goal for the work of self-active play, whether you're a child or an adult, and there are multiple reasons why it's good, in my view, the main purpose is to attain a higher, more enjoyable state of being, whether you're a child or an adult. So a moment ago, Paula mentioned there were two forms of self-active play. One is solo or solitary. It's more contemplative and quiet, as some of you may know. And the other is more cooperative. It's more robust. You're working with somebody else and you're interacting. How did I get into this work? I'm going to go back just quickly to the 70s. I had an opportunity to work as the director of the African Primary Science Program in Sierra Leone, West Africa. I was an expert. I went to Sierra Leone to teach the teachers in those schools and some Peace Corps volunteers all about science. And when I got over there, I quickly realized that they were much more expert than I was at using the natural environment as a tool, a resource for teaching science. One of the things I learned is they used the flowers and the rocks and the roots and the branches and the animals as what the children naturally know about in their community and therefore it becomes what to study, what's available, 
what they can contact and make sense of. I came back to the United States and I worked in Region 1 Head Start for a while. But then I said to my wife, Kitty, I said, there's something to this work that involves looking about resources in our own community and a developed society. What natural resources do we have? And I say the materials that businesses throw away are natural resources in an industrialized society. So Kitty, my wife and I founded the Institute for Self-Active Education based on the teachings of Friedrich Froebel. And as some of you may know, way back into two centuries ago, he wrote a book called The Education of Man. And in that book, he proclaims the child as divine, not unlike what Laris Malaguzzi teaches about children, capable, creative, superlative learners naturally. So Froebel says, in order for the children to experience that inner capacity to create, to understand, to develop, to express, to become what they are going to be, they need to be fully immersed, the whole being immersed in sensory experience or self-activity. Freubel speaks of the self as the divine being. You know, we, I, I'm a, this is a digression. We just had our third, we had a, a little baby in our family three weeks ago. His name is Helix. And I see pictures of him. He's living in California. And I get goosebumps when I see that little baby. He is so perfect coming into this world. And his eyes are already open and he's looking, making contact with my wife went out there. She just spent 10 days with this baby. I wish I could have gone. But the point is, those little innocent babies are so precious and are caring for them with the vision of their holiness and their capacity to create is the goal of self-active education. So a key piece of our work has become finding resources, making them available. And then over the past 40 years working with NACI, I've had the opportunity of presenting hands-on play workshops. I think 27 years of actual experiences for three hours in NACI. It was amazing. I got so convinced that this experience for adults is a key way of heightening their understanding. Whatever level an adult is, this play form of solo and cooperative play, the protocols that we're gonna be doing have a way of transforming, enriching the practice that you already have and enriching it. And I think the way it works is that the solo play especially allows you to tap into your intuitive sublime self. It does it with the child. There's no outer influence. There's a pure connection. Frabel calls that the inner connection. It is a meditation with your eyes open and your hands involved with the materials. I'm excited about that possibility for all of our children all over the world. It'll take a little while, of course, but we need to work in that direction. Let me back up just a little bit and say the purpose of the Institute for Self-Active Education is to awaken creative potential, simply. Awaken the power within us child or adult, to experience that and to realize our capacities are much greater than we sometimes think or feel about ourselves. And so it is with children. So especially now in this period of, well, say COVID and the trauma that many adults and children are experiencing, there's a need and a role for silent solo play to calm the mind, to focus within and allow the, fall, the flow of your own inner relaxation to re reconnect and rekindle you in the busy lives we all live. That's why we did that moment of meditation. So let's talk for a moment now about chapter one. 
This little book that Marsha, Marsha Nell is a dear friend and co-author, as some of you, well, those of you who have the book know that. She was the director of professional development and research for the Institute oh, for about 10 years, and she's now retired. I invited her to come tonight, but she's actually caring for her ailing mother down in Fort Myers. So what I'd like to do is, um, is just kind of read a couple of passages and then we're going to pose the question to you. Um, is there anything in what you read in this book, especially in the first chapter, that resonated with you, that caught your eye, that caused you to feel there's a little something there that pertains to me personally. Perhaps it has an implication. And maybe in what I read now, there'll be some resonance, okay? That's the idea. So Paolo reminds me that the chapter one is really about laying the theoretical foundation for self-active play. So I, I marked some spots that I thought I'd just actually read. Maybe some of you have already done the same thing, you know, mark some, I mean, you could pick almost any sentence about this delightful book and it resonates, at least it does with me, of course. So the first thing I would like to suggest is that this little quote here, you know, uh, Pestalozzi was a contemporary Froebel. So this, is, this writing goes back to 1898. It's a short passage. So I would say just relax for the next few minutes. And I'd like to introduce these colleagues to you as friends and mentors. Pestalozzi is with us tonight. And he says, basically, spontaneous efforts, spontaneous efforts. But what the teacher presents does not always absorb the whole attention of the child. Sometimes not any at all. The child has his own interests, some knowledge it strongly desires. And therefore, will seek this of its own free will and throw its whole soul into that search, the will stimulated by self-activity of all the faculties, the whole child, prompts to spontaneous effort. This is a step toward moral self-activity and independence. There's much for us to discuss about anything I may read this evening. This strikes me as a core teaching that the child, regardless of external influence, has his own interests and powers, his will to learn what he's interested in. And we want to be mindful of that. Just as right in this moment, you may yourself have something you're interested in, and you may not get to share it, you may not get to explore it. I apologize if that's the case. I hope this is aligned with your interests. I'm going to read a little more. This is also, this is also from uh, our colleague Froebel. I think I'm going to short this a little bit because we started a little late. By education, then, the divine essence of man should be unfolded, brought out. You might ask, what is he talking about? What's the divine essence? What, what, what is that? Brought out, lifted into consciousness, and man or woman himself raised into free conscious obedience to the divine principle that lives within him, and so to a free representation of the principle in his life. So the book is touching upon spiritual thinking 
about the development of the whole child, the spirit of the child, the spirit of the adult, the spirit of nature, the spirit of play, the spirit of dancing, the spirit of the joy of learning. All right, just laying out some things for us to keep in mind. Just briefly, I wanna be mindful of the time. Oh my goodness. Um, let's see, a little further. Um, if you do that with children, if we do that, as we do that with children, they will surely be a thorough determined man and or woman capable of self-sacrifice for the promotion of the welfare of himself or herself and others. So Froebel described play as not trivial. It is highly serious and of deep significance and as humans. That's a quote from Froebel. I think well, I'll read one more from Froebel. Um, Froebel was a strong proponent of putting children at the center of their own education, self-directed. Along with the child-centered perspective, Froebel stressed the importance of children being fully active in their learning, sensorily active, fully integrated. He stressed the value of using materials, using materials, concrete operational experiences, just like Piaget did later on, to solidify the connection between the external world and the internal world. That comes back to the inner connection again. The child interprets his world, his own capacities to operate in the world through the interaction with three-dimensional materials or fluid materials like paint play or water play, where they're in control. They have the freedom to explore. I'm going to move forward a little bit here to our next thinker. Um, I'm going to sort of skip lightly over Stuart Brown. Well, uh, one passage that impacted me was that Brown further asserted, this is Stuart Brown, the author of that wonderful book, Bruett Brown said, uh, asserted that the impulse to play is actually a biological drive, such as the need for food, water, and shelter. The biological need does not diminish over time, but remains throughout the lifespan. Allow me to be a personal testimony to that. I'm 82 and play is very important to my own well-being as an older fellow. So play still provides valuable benefits for adults. We should be doing play in assisted living facilities. We'll talk about that later. It's in the book also, or you should now. You might want to do that. Skipping on, we'll have some time for questions also. So please keep your questions in mind. Thomas Hendricks, Thomas Hendricks, a brilliant, brilliant sociologist wrote this wonderful book, Play and the Human Condition. It's really built on the work of um, uh, Brian Sutton Smith, who passed away some time ago. And he used to live in Florida. Before that, he was a professor at Penn State. But Tom Hendricks is, um, you know, oh, here's one of the things he says. It's, um, this is on page 15. He says, he says, how do we discover who we are? Here you sit. What are you doing to discover who you are and who you will become? How do we determine the character of the world in which we live? How do we understand our environment? And how do we decide what we can do in a world so configured? These are enormously important questions when we think about children and we realize the answer is all self-active play. It's through their active play that they come to find answers to these questions. And Tom, as you read, as you read perhaps, has these lenses, he looks at play and he defines them really carefully. 
play as action and it's self-directed and develops consciousness, a higher consciousness. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit because um, I see the time is 741 and I do, I do not want to overlook the other things that we're hoping to do with you this evening. Um, just a little bit about Brian Sutton Smith. I met him along with Tom uh, Hendricks when I was working with the uh, Association for the Study of Play, which I would recommend all of you know about, and we can share information with you. They're gonna have its, uh, I think it's 47th International Annual Conference Virtual uh, hosted by the University of Nebraska on May 21st. And we'll send information to you on that. And it's a, it's a pittance to join. Um, uh, but Brian Sutton Smith wrote several wonderful books. The last one he wrote is called Play for Life. Play for Life. Play for Living a Full Life, a Happy Life Play. And the last thing I wanted to share from Brian Sutton Smith and concluded that the variability of play, the adaptive variability of play, is the key to play and that structurally play is characterized by its quirkiness its redundancy and its flexibility so play has these multitude of arenas or domains that it can be applied in you know this little book was written primarily for adults to play to use it as a tool for educating anybody more about play well, you see, I've already concluded my brief report and reading on summer on, on chapter one. This is next the next time we meet. I, I, I'm just going to set this aside. And I know there may be some questions, uh, certainly the one I had asked you. I think Paul is going to underscore it and perhaps uh, from this point, give me a little break. Paul, would you do that? Could you? Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Drew. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thank so, you. So I was uh, I was so um, worried about not being able to get my presentation that I I did forget to share how the book club started. So our our journey uh, with the, the doctor that I met Dr. Drew about 15 years ago in a conference in Washington D.C. I had known about him prior to meeting him because I would go to the different uh, workshops and I would see hundreds of people just playing with all these materials um, until one day I approached him and um, just long story short, he told me he was from Melbourne, we're from Florida and um, that's where our relationship began. He um, later came to the school and um, with you know, with open-ended uh, materials and our teachers began working with self-active play and that's how everything began. Um, moving forward, um, I read the first book and then I read the second book. Um, this book, I highly recommend it. It's like, it's like highlighted like on every single page because there's so many, um, there's so many valuable um, things that are on that book. And um, one of the things that I, you know, from the beginning um, that I value about self-active play, and I'm gonna read this like really quick, is that it's rooted in the awareness that play in the early years is an essential, that are mentally appropriate practices necessary for healthy human development and continues across the entire lifespan, as Dr. Drew had already mentioned. Whether as a child or an adult, self-active play puts the player in control of the experience, free to create and express their unique thoughts and feelings. Self-active play uses open-ended materials in hands-on, silent, solitary, and cooperative play experiences. Each format is designed to awaken creativity and self-expression in children and adults alike. Um, the, the first chapter that Dr. Drew went through, um, again, there's tons I have, I not only did I uh, highlight it, but I, I wrote on it because I had so many questions. And so then I, I came to Dr. Drew um, in his um, uh, reusable uh, 
center uh, that he has in Melbourne. And, um, and I, and I, and I said, well, first of all, can I have a, can I have an autograph? And then um, I started asking all kinds of questions. And I said, you know, I, I think that other educators uh, will value the work of this, of that, that you have here um, with Dr. Marsha. And, um, and so then uh, we, we began to talk about, you know, forming a book club and, and then here we are. Um, I appreciate that the vocabulary, it's easy for anyone to understand of all different levels. It's not, it, it's, it, it's in a vocabulary that, you know, our teachers can, can understand. Um, I, I can say that going through the process of self-active play throughout the years, I have seen the transformation that has happened within our own educators. Um, you know, we, we come from the educational system that we've inherited and, and we, we, we were, um, we came from this traditional type of teaching until I, I, I was introduced to self-active play and I saw um, how it was transforming um, the education, in, you know, inside our school, not just with our, we began with our educators. And then it triggered down because they were learning the processes that children go through play. Um, I have many questions on this on this book, and I and I have some that I, I wonder um, also if there's something that you can identify. Um, you know, if you don't have the book, you know, from the things that Dr. Drew mentioned um, on chapter one um, that resonated with you during the first chapter. With me, there were a lot of aha moments from, from uh, validating what, you know, what we are currently doing um, to, to understanding how the theories are connected when we see children play. But what caught your attention, like from the words that, that you heard Dr. Drew today? Well, it could be something you read, you know, in the book. Is, was there any, I, I want to ask a question. I, I wonder how many of you actually read chapter one, have the book that would help. But I won't ask the question. I just wonder about it. But is there anything that you may have read in the book that it sort of caught your attention that has some value for you? So I was thinking that um, I feel like our education system is kind of like this pendulum where we go to this extreme belief of one way and then we go back to another way and the pendulum just keeps on swinging. Um, how long has that happened for? So when I look at the theorists, I think of Bell, and I think, okay, how did he play as a child? What was his experience? And from what I know about him is he had an unhappy childhood. Um, so what did that play experience look like for him, for him to come up with such powerful words behind that? You know, what was his experience? What was the experience with um, even uh, Plato? You know, all of these, I think, help all of our experiences form our theories and what we believe in. So where was that pendulum at that time? Yeah, um, I could take a shot at it, not having been there, I'm not so sure. But <laughs> one thing we wanna know is realize that that's a completely different world in that time. Yeah. There weren't any classrooms even, there wasn't any formal instruction. Froebel was one of the beginning people to work with young children. Before that time, families kept their kids at home. They worked on farms for the most part. And it's true that Froebel had a very difficult early life. I think what helped him overcome those emotional barriers is what he was doing with his life. What he was doing with his life is working and playing with the children. So it was the children themselves and the materials that he developed, you know, Froebel's very famous for sets of materials 
and one of them, of course, was blocks. And he used the blocks in teaching children mathematics, essentially. He also did a lot of gardening. So the play in those days was just beginning to be object play, other than the things that maybe husbands or wives might have made for their children. They made these homemade toys. Like someone just discovered very recently, and it was reported on the national news, someone uncovered a cache of toys from the 18th century that had been stored somewhere in somebody's attic. The other thing is the gardening, the outdoor play that they did. And I think those contributed to his later joy. I think later on, he was also working extensively to train parents to do this kind of play in their homes. And so he was also training the teachers that worked in his school. Uh, I don't know Susan beyond that, but my sense is the man had a creative passion and a vision that he was working on with those children. And seeing several pictures of him, of photographs or drawings of him, he was a happy man as a man later on because of his work with the children. So and that he, play was actually healing. Oh, absolutely. Play is absolutely healing. Yes. And in his life, I'm projecting that, that part of his healing had to do working with children, playing with children, gardening with children. Think about the joy in those. Wasn't public, private education. It, it, it wasn't like we have today as public education, with all the administrative demands that are on our teachers and all the regulations. There was freedom in those days. And in a sense, what we're advocating for is more freedom for children, more self-direction for children, inside and outside. Others might have a response to Susan's question or observation, or maybe there's another response to Paula's question. Thank you, Susan. Susan, I think what's interesting is uh, the pendulum of education continuously shifts. Play is still, is, has not shifted. Its importance, its relevance, um, and the aspect of just being. If you think of curriculum, right? Mm -hmm. Curriculum, we go over here, and then curriculum goes over here, and then you have to purchase this one, and then you have to buy this one, you have to train on this one. We have this constant back and forth of, curriculum, but play has remained constant. Um, the toys may have changed, but the, but the ideology behind play um, is, is steadfast and true. And I think um, that's telltaling in and of itself. Um, one of the things oh, that I thought of when Susan asked her question and then Walter filled in on how the society um, was different back then, um, we want to promote play with through experiences and materials in our programs, but we are also entering a culture um, that's so technol technological that children, I think, run the risk of being exposed to less and less and less materials in their homes when they're given an electronic device that might have three dimensional images of a material blocks on the two um, on the device, we have to, we almost have to um, now and in the next 20 years, we're gonna have to really promote what um, the essentiality of using materials with their hands as what play is instead of, oh yeah, my kids play all the time. They're on video games all the time. My kids know about play. That's so our current culture is so far removed from, you know, 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 50 years ago with the materials and the experiences that we also are going to have to um, remember to bring all, that we're providing for these kids something that they may not even have exposure at home or even the materials to use at home. Um, it's just the technology is really going to um, interfere with organic play, the biology that it's so natural, continuing on in the generations to come. That's just one, one of the things I thought of just now as I was listening to you guys talk. Yeah. Thank you, Tammy, right on. Two-dimensional thinking, digitally, three-dimensional thinking with materials. 
Angela, I think you had a, a comment to make. Yeah, I'm, I'm just so excited about what everybody is saying. And I agree uh, completely with you, Dr. Drew, and with you, Julie, is that um, regardless of what um, curriculums or what mandates or, you know, that's all, to me, that's all noise. I was a director of a, a school district. Uh, I just retired after 32 years and now I teach at a university and I've been in early childhood since 1983. Started in Tallahassee, by the way, Chris, and uh, um, opened up school for young children with Dr. Wolfgang and, uh, and been in training with uh, Dr. Phelps with creative, I went over to creative to be trained, but so I think between all of the noise and all the mandates, and I've had some Facebook conversations with Paola regarding uh, this, is that how do we drown out all the noise like Julie is saying, and that the pedagogy of play remains constant. So for us, the guidance was always, uh, you know, this new mandate, that new mandate, this, you know, how we have to achieve these standards and that is that how can we do that in the most developmentally appropriate way with play-based experiences. So if, if you are if you are strong in your philosophy, and I uh, we you know we ask a lot of open-ended questions and have a lot of open-ended discussions even with the students at the university, and say, okay, if you are the voice of early childhood, if you are the next advocates of early childhood, how can you you know that that constant of play and what's developmentally appropriate for young children, that hasn't changed in a long time. So that's why I'm so excited about going to see maybe uh, Kinderu one day is because somehow in a developmentally appropriate way with play-based experiences, along with all of those other mandates, Kinderu is meeting that, even teacher of the year, you know. And back to what Tammy was saying about technology um, invading our lives. Again, I think, I think society has to accept things that are, that are relevant and that are brought into our culture. But again, how can we do that in the most developmentally appropriate way? And instead of saying, oh, everything can go technology or technology has no place in early childhood, I look at Kinderu as the example to say, children are working with technology all day. They're working with cameras, they're working with lighting, they're working with microscopes, they're working, you know, they, they, you know um, it's just amazing how technology can be incorporated in a developmentally appropriate way. So I'll stop my soapbox now, but I'm just very excited about uh, the book study and the conversations that we're having. That's great, thank you, Angela, thank you, yeah. You know, there's so much. I, um, I, um, I just want to note that time is 759. Oh. Um, and I, I think it's an obligation oh, so. of the convener to uh, end the session officially at the hour of eight so that we can count on that for anybody who would like to leave. And if it's appropriate, and we should all decide that together, really. Um, if you, if, you, if you need to leave because we said eight o'clock, then you leave automatically and everybody understands that. And otherwise we can stay for a little bit. Is that right, Paula? Um, what yes, do you think? yes, yes. But so eight o'clock, um, you know, officially we over. Be, yeah. We will post um, on Facebook, on the Facebook group um, where we discuss after eight o'clock. Yeah, good. Um, you know, there's something that came to mind and I wrote it down. It says, what does putting children at the center of your own education mean to you? And how open-minded are you to the things that they play with? Um, and I have an example because I think that uh, we can sometimes interrupt play not giving it the value that children give to them. And um, one example, and, and somebody brought it up, was um, the children playing video games um, from an early age. Um, what I, my children play video games and, and it was their, I mean, it, it was their era, like, you know, like children now that, I mean, that's their era. But um, so I, I recently became acquainted with 
uh, a different world new to me, which is the stock market. And, um, you know, listening to the stock news, I hear how all these gamers, how much money they're making because inside the gaming world, there is, uh, there's NFTs and all these things that I did not know about. Um, when I asked my children, my children knew exactly, you know, oh yes, and you buy this. And so like they're developing apps and they're, um, they're, they have social communities and it's, 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 it's amazing. Like what I'm saying is that we now live in the world of, of these children, like not, you know, the, and yes, we're going to play for, for our entire lifetime, but what some children consider play, you know, I, I think sometimes we get, um, we, we step in and interrupt it and, and, and that's, it's a dangerous zone because that's when like all the creativity, like all their ideas, everything is coming when you allow that child to be able to um, engage in play and, and not just in place, but the things that they're interested in and, and, and supporting them through the things that, that they're interested in. And perhaps you becoming interested as well in order for you to support them. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, that, you know, this re resonated with me um, when I was reading some of the theorists. And then again, what does putting children at the center of their own education mean to you inside your classrooms? Yeah, I don't wanna discount digital technology. Um, it is the way that some children are playing. Um, I know there's research I saw some poster research at, I think it was TASC when we actually met the last time about um, the ingenuity, the problem solving, the creativity. I mean, if you've ever played Candy Crush or any of those games, right? They're digital games and yes, they're solitary and there's not a lot of interaction. But if you look at the creativity behind that, um, we don't wanna discount it, but you know, the idea of early exposure to digital stimuli is a, is a topic for another book study, perhaps. Um, you know, the value of play when it comes to technology or digital technology. Um, but I still think we need to make sure that we honor that early childhood from birth to, to four with those hands-on sensorial types of activities um, to wire the brain that way. And then as, and then have a plan in place to start including that STEM or STEAM type of electronic or digital type of things, because uh, at some point they're gonna be, they're gonna be running the world, right? And uh, digital is just gonna be, just gonna be part of that, so. I was just gonna chime in and um, talk about um, how I've noticed how when I step back from play in my classroom, that's when I feel like all the learning is happening. Um, not going, oh, you have six blocks, you know, just like stepping back, seeing what they do with the materials and, and allowing them to invite me into their play. I have one-year-olds and people come into my class and say, oh wow like they act like they're five years old you know um because they're so engrossed in the materials i think that i've just been learning the more open-ended materials that i have incorporated in my classroom that are natural that are what they see in the home is when i feel like all the learning is happening not necessarily what the curriculum says And hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully there can be a curriculum chosen that does, that is play-based and play-focused. But I love what you said about um, stepping out sometimes and really, um, and I love what Paula said about uh, maybe adults sometimes interrupting that play. So sometimes we're a barrier to play and we're a barrier to learning. So if we are observers and know developmentally where our children are at, and sometimes we can enhance the play. So I love, I love the, you know, to me, a play is purposeless. Um, we sometimes as adults um, and as educators are uncomfortable with that, you know, 
And, um, and so we want to do, you know, we want to write lesson plans and we want to do all this stuff. And, um, um, but instead to, to refocus that, um, like what Dominique said, and um, say, how can we enhance that play? So if we know our children, if we uh, we know them as individuals, some of our children may be language disabled, some of our children may be developmentally delayed, some of our children may have behavioral issues, whatever it is, um, how can we step in then and enhance that play? That child that, that may be language delayed, we can help interpret that to enhance the play. But like you said, Dominique, you're stepping out of that play. You're only stepping in to enhance or maybe to scaffold that learning um, a little bit. So if they are building with blocks or they're building with that tower and you know you, you, you see that aha moment, you know, sh shrinking away, you know, if you can stay or do something to support those higher order thinking skills or take them to the next level, um, you know, but I love that you, that your children invite you into play. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's incredible. That's amazing. That's what we want. Um, Julie, uh, mm -hmm. um, I, I want to add just, um, just a few words about adult play. Um, mm -hmm. Julie, at the beginning of the call said, um, how I take wonderful pictures and how I do wonderful videos. Um, those are my teachers. They have now surpass my abilities because they play, because they're giving the time to, to, to play with, you know, with technology, with the materials. And, and over a period of, of time, they, they, they reflect on it and they, it, it, it's amazing to see the, the transformation that happens when, when you are involved with self-active play. So I just, I just wanted to, to mention that because, because Julie, it's not, they're not even mine anymore. I, it, it, they, they send all that. And, and if you ever uh, see any of our social media, um, those are the images of our educators and the documentation that, you know, that we document every day. And so like what you see there is, is the learning processes that take uh, place during, during their play. Um, I know it's 808 and I just want to say that Dr. Drew and I had spoken prior to this session and, and he wanted to uh, propose a playful assignment uh, before our next meeting, which is scheduled for Wednesday, March 16. Um, he wants you to informally observe, listen, record any experiences with open-ended materials. So you can investigate the materials, like what happens when you play with them, um, or when, with, you know, what happens when the children play with them. What ideas come to mind? Uh, it may be dreams, it may be connections, events from the past. Um, we don't really know what experiences will come forward until you play. So this is an open-ended experience; it's not prescribed. And then Dr. Drew's. Um, he, he said, well, you know, like if I have to write a prescription, my prescription or wish is that you relax, um, that you play alone, you meditate, uh, you explore the materials and that you don't, you know, don't forget to play soft music in, in the background. And, um, and so then, you know, once you have these experiences, uh, we want you to be prepared to share them with them at our next Zoom meeting. And um, all this is written down on the Facebook page, just in case um, you know you you don't have what the assignment is. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's just play. We want you to play. Dr. Drew wants you to play. And and those were I just translated the words, the conversation that that we both had. And I did put that information in the chat. Also, the link to the book club is in the chat as well. Uh, if you kind of scroll up, in fact, I'll do it again just to Thank add you. in. Thank um, you, Jimmy. Yep. And so both of those, uh, your assignment, which we will um, we'll do a follow-up email with you guys regarding that assignment a couple of times, just, just to provoke the consideration of taking that challenge on. Um, and, and for some of us that live insane lives, um, taking the challenge to rest and rejuvenate and play and understanding that there's no 
box I have to put myself in and what that means. And so my documentation of play might look very different than Domingue, you know, Dominique's or Gabriella's or Nancy's or whoever. And so coming back together March 16th at this time at seven um, and being able to share those either images or thoughts or poems or, or whatever documentation you've done is going to be absolutely mind blowing. I just know it is. And add that to the second chapter. If you've not already read ahead, uh, it's just going to be, it's going to be phenomenal. Dr. Drew, anything you would like to close us with before I finalize our closing? Yeah. Uh, let me see. Two things. No, three. Briefly. Um, one is what what Paula was sharing about our conversation and asking you to do things, it's in no way obligatory. You know, it's just like some of you may have a little extra time and find it okay to do that. You don't have to do that. It's just a thought. Um, the second thing is with regards to the earlier conversation about using um, the, the experience of the children's play as a tool to go a little deeper or to guide their thinking. I would say absolutely that's important, but I would ask you to think very carefully about the timing of your interactions with the child. The timing. It, um, I, I, I believe that it's better to wait until the child is no longer intensely focused and engaged than to do any provocation or questioning. So the timing of your interaction with children during their play really is a sensitive place to uh, enter. Um, remember, the child is in a state of essentially mindfulness, and you want to honor that presence. And the third thing is, in closing, I want to leave you this little thought about the nitty gritty dirt band and then we'll close the session we're going to take off. Is that right, Paulo? Is there anything else that we I think that's it, right? Okay. Anybody else have anything before we close? We're, going, we're a moment away from closing now. Anybody? Okay. So we're all grateful for all of us being present. Thank you again for being present. And here's that little wish from the nitty gritty dirt band. It's a, it's a, a music uh, poem. May the long time sun shine upon you and all love surround you and the pure light within you guide you on your way. Yeah, guide you on your way. So wishing you all well until our next time together. Thank you so much, Paula, for joining me and for Julie for helping to guide us through this and everybody for being present. Your questions and presence, deeply appreciated. Read on chapter two and beyond, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Good night, Bye, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, Mom. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye, Dr. Drew. Bye, Julie. Thank Bye, you. Paul. Bye, everyone. Dynamite. Dynamite. Good night, Gabriella and Terry Cohen. We didn't hear from you. I hope we hear next time we're going to be in touch, right, Terry? If you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Drew. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm glad you were here, Gabrielle. Bye. Terry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm.